Well, good morning. Welcome to Prime Time at the U Library. I'm Eric Fisher. I'm the Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities and also Acting Dean right now. And I think it says Acting Dean. Uh, introducing this morning's program. Now, Prime Time is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library and Faculty Development and many other offices on campus, celebrating learning beyond the classroom through the experience and accomplishments of other faculty, students, and staff. Uh, join us next Tuesday, March 26th, when we'll Alana Westland shares about the expectations and reality of her study abroad experience at the Secretary University in London. I'm delighted to welcome you to an Edwin Scholars presentation. The Edwin Scholars program supports faculty and student research teams as they collaborate on a research project. The project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to a given field of study, and the project must reflect meaningful collaboration on research between students and faculty. The Edwin Scholars program is named after John Alexis Edwin, the founder of what is now Bethel University. And one of the key educational principles that Edwin articulated in the 19th century, which was a fairly radical idea then, is, quote, the relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. And it was in that spirit that then Provost Jay Barnes established Edwin Scholars Program 13 years ago in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. So today, Dr. Rollin King, Professor of Chemistry, and Sarah Greiderman Leo, who is majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology, will present their research on chiral molecules. Now, chiral comes from the Greek word for hand. And if I understand it, chirality is the asymmetry of an object that cannot, that cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. And our hands are a good example of that. So, Rowan, if you shake hands with me, we can illustrate chirality. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't work. It's an asymmetrical relationship, as much as I understand. So, as they will explain far better than I can, chiral molecules play a central role in the requests for new medical drugs and chemical catalysts. However, the way that these molecules interact with light, a phenomenon called optical rotation, presents some significant challenges to experimentation. These are challenges that computational quantum chemistry can be helpful in overcoming. So Dr. King and Sarah collaborated with a group at Virginia Tech to perform computations of optical rotation in order to better understand the effects of salvation. Now, salvation, not to be confused with salvation, <laughs> is also sometimes called dissolution, which is another condition we want to avoid. Anyway, is the product is the process of attraction and association of molecules of a solvent with molecules or ions of a solute. And that is about as much of 10th grade chemistry as I can remember. Uh, the results of their work will improve the ability to predict how these molecules will behave and thereby support further experiments. So let's welcome Ron Lerner. Thank you. Thank you. So the title seems like kind of a mouthful, but hopefully by the end um, you'll be able to understand what this means better. So I'm Sarah and Leah, as was introduced, and this is our project predicting the optical rotation of solvated chiral molecules via incorporation of explicit solvent effects. So because we don't know everyone's science background here, we're going to start really broad and then kind of get a little more specific as we go on. So mirror images are familiar to us. Anyone who's looking in the mirror understands that you have a reflection. Um, but what isn't always known is that mirror images are not always superimposable. So this means that if you have a mirror image and you have its um, original image and you try to put them on top of each other, they are not going to be identical. They're not going to produce one image. Um, so in examples, if we take this picture we have up front, and if we were to cut it along its axis of reflection, right around there, and then flip the bottom picture up 180 degrees, they would not produce the same image, but instead they would be very distinct from each other. So as we heard earlier, a perfect example of this is seen in hands. So if you've ever tried on the left hand baseball mitt with your right hand, you know that it doesn't really work and you've like felt this physical difference. This is because hands are mirror images of each other. So if you hold up your hands with palms up or palms down, pick your favorite, and pretend like there's a mirror in between, you can see that they are reflections of each other. Likewise, if you try to superimpose them on top of each other, um, you'd see that it can't be done. They're not going to produce one image, but they're distinct from each other. So just as many things like objects in our world have this left and right-handedness, 
so do molecules. Now, it's easy to think in chemistry of everything as being two-dimensional, but in reality, it's three-dimensional. Um, so molecules are also going to have this left in hand, right, or er, chirality, it's called. So um, molecules that have mirror images are known as chiral molecules. Um, so now, images that have the same molecular formula and same atoms, but different arrangement in space, um, different orientations, are known as stereoisomers. And two of the stereoisomers that have the exact mirror image of each other are known specifically as enantiomers. So what distinguishes one enantiomer from another, like this example up front, or this nice example right here, um, is that they're going to have the different orientation in space, and that's known as the absolute configuration of each one. So now everything in our world, as I said before, is three-dimensional, even chemistry. Um, so a fun example of this is in our body, all our receptors are chiral as well. So our taste and our smell, um, we're going to have different senses for one enantiomer versus the other one. So a fun example is if I took that stock of asparagus up there and squeezed out some juice, um, you would be able to isolate the amino acid L-asparagine, which has a bitter taste. Um, and the difference between this and its enantiomer, or mirror image, is that the amine group right here is sticking out, versus in its mirror image, it's going into the page. So these are exactly the same, except they're mirror images from each other. Um, so its mirror image, while from asparagus directly is bitter, the mirror image is sweet. So this is another just um, way of showing that they have biologically different functions. Now, a more serious example of this can be seen in the drug thalidomide that was released in the 1950s and 1960s in Europe. Uh, this drug was known to alleviate morning sickness, um, and there was, it became a really popular drug, and it had an effective isomer that had this group coming out of the page. But what they did not know is that it's an antimer that went into the page, this mirror image, caused really bad birth effects because it was able to intercalate in between the DNA um, and cause underdevelopment of limbs in the children being born. So this is just a picture of a little girl that was affected by this drug, and it was very common at that time. And now there's whole societies of people that are probably in their four, I don't know, math, 40s, 50s, <laughs> and that are um, affected by this drug. So this really drives home the importance of chirality and enhancing their purity in drugs. Now that we've established the biological difference of three-dimensional chemicals, they also have some physical or chemical differences um, known as optical rotation. So it's kind of a weird sort of thing, but chiral molecules are able to rotate a plane of polarized light in a single direction. So this is a polarimeter, and if we were able to isolate a plane of polarized light and then send it through a sample tube containing one pure enantiomer, it would rotate the light in a single direction to a certain magnitude. Now, if we were able to fill the tube with the opposite enantiomer, um, it would rotate the exact same magnitude, but in the reverse direction. So, if we we're, it has to be more than a 50-50 mix. There has to be an excess of one of the enantiomers in order for this to happen. Um, but this is a unique characteristic to chiral molecules. And when it rotates it right or left, it's known as dextrorotatory or levorotatory. So, Although we can use this technique to find which way it rotates light, you cannot correspond this to the absolute configuration. There's no way um, to use this rule, there's no theoretical rule or experimental rule to align the specific rotation or optical rotation with which absolute configuration it is. But if there was a method in order to align these two, we could use this as a good experimental technique in order to um, test the purity of a sample or to identify which sample we have in the tube. So in drug discovery and development, it's often that drugs are discovered naturally, um, like in a rare plant, and then um, used as organic chemists synthesize out the biologically active material in them, and then test that further to see what this drug can be mimicked or how it can be used. So a good close to home example is right here at Bethel um, in the research of Dr. Trey Maddox and Dr. Teresa de Gaulier. Um, they're working on blue cohosh and um, isolating right now N-methylcytosine from the blue cohosh plant, which we have pictured right here. And then using that to further test um, its responses on uterine contractions in mice. So this is a common practice to isolate drugs out of plants and then to often synthesize further drugs 
to maybe make them more commercially available or to bypass some side effects that aren't wanted. Um, so it's, it's a common practice. Now, up here we have a picture of anagyrene, which is not the molecule they are focusing on, but it's another biologically active um, chemical in blue cohosh, and it has three chiral centers, like right here, right here, and right here. So it's very common for drugs to be chiral. Um, and plants, by nature, only make one enantiomer, one of the mirror images. And this exact mirror image is going to have a specific function that can be often used medically. Um, but when we take this and try to synthesize in the lab a mimic of this image, we often get a mixture of both enantiomers. And as we saw with the drug thalidomide, this can be bad, toxic, have functions that we don't want. So it's really important to carefully control every step of the synthesis in order to see what enantiomer or mirror image we have each step along the way. Um, and other than the property of optical rotation or biologically, a lot of the functions of um, enantiomers physically are indistinguishable. So you cannot tell them apart. Um, so it's really difficult and costly in order to do these purifications. So this is where computational chemistry can really come in hand. Um, like I mentioned before, there's no theoretical rule or experimental rule in order to align the specific rotation or optical rotation with the absolute configuration that we want. Um, but computational chemistry with large advances in technology has been able to do this. So it's really exciting because if we can provide accurate and reliable results, um, we can use the polarimeter or just this property of optical rotation as a method of reference. So you can think of if you're in organic chemistry and you're synthesizing a product and you get just a mix and you don't know is this a pure product or which one I have, which mirror image do I have, you could run it through a polarimeter, find the optical rotation, and then compare it to the theoretical optical rotation and align it with its absolute configuration. So it can be used as a good tool um, of reference. So what is computational chemistry? So computational chemistry is a branch of chemistry that uses computer power to solve um, difficult chemical problems. So it uses mathematical models based on each individual atom in a structure, and then combines these to solve um, hard algorithms using the different software. So it allows us to apply theories quantitatively, and um, it really links together observation, computation, and experiment. So you can think of, if you make an observation, you form a hypothesis, and often, normally we think of, immediately testing this out in the experiment, but also if you, you can form an observation, do computations on it, get the results, and then form an experiment. So these all are relying on each other to bounce off each other and help confirm the results and make sure things are accurate. So while um, computation has been used many times in literature to um, both proceed and confirm experimental results, there have been times, um, like optical rotation, when it's difficult and large discrepancies remain, and it's hard to predict um, how it, it aligns with experiment. So what's been accomplished? So molecules in the gas phase, or molecules where it's one isolated molecule with no solvent around, um, we're able to accurately predict the optical rotation using computational me methods. So this is really good news, except for the fact that in real life, a lot of these reactions are occurring in solvent. So a lot of them are in aqueous environments, which means that you use water or carbon tetrachloride or another such solvent to surround the solute and dissolve it in order for these reactions to occur. So interestingly enough, although like things like energy and other properties are not dependent on solvent, optical rotation is very dependent. So whether or not the solvent itself is chiral, you think of water, H2O, it's not chiral, um, it will still have effects on the optical rotation. So this makes it very difficult in making reliable predictions um, and knowing what exactly is going to happen in these computations. So one method in order to um, test this phenomenon and understand what's going on is explicit solvation. And this attempts to model the effects of the bulk solvent um, by using only a few solvent molecules around the solute and see the direct implications of what is going on. Unfortunately, this has size and number restrictions. Size being that the larger the solvent gets, the more difficult these calculations get, and the more you add, the more difficult it is. So these are some of the programs I use. Um, while some of them are more for visualizing the data, like Gaussian or Spartan, actually mostly Spartan, other ones are used for making these high accuracy um, calculations, like Sci4. Um, 
So these are programs that I had to get familiar with as I started working, um, and now I'm more comfortable with running them. So if you did not know this before this point, I'm not in a lab mixing chemicals, doing research like that. I'm working on computers. So I'm working on Unix and Linux machines. Um, the main station I'm at is Radigas, which is down in the physical chemistry lab. Um, it's a 2 by 16 core opera. Another one I'm working on is Cerebro at Virginia Tech. And Calhoun, which is a 2 by 4 core in Zion at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute down at the U of M. So I obviously don't fly down to Virginia Tech every time I do a calculation, so I'm able to run these remotely, which is good news for me. And it's it was interesting when I first met. I didn't realize that, oh, I can work on other computers out in Virginia or down at the U of M while sitting in the lab or wherever else I am. So, so this is my process in a nutshell, or what I do for my method. So as I kind of began explaining before, explicit solvation tries to model the bulk solvent by just adding a few solvent molecules. So what I do is I create molecules on Spartan and optimize the geometry, which means just trying to tighten the geometry to get a good um, guess of what the molecule actually looks like with the solvent. And then I extract this geometry and run optical rotations um, using two different methods. Um, Psi4, I use, which is a program that I had before, to get high accuracy results. And then I get the numbers of the optical rotations and compare them and see how they're different from each other. A second technique I use is called molecular dynamics, in which is kind of a box method, which you put a solute in a box and surround it by solvent and run it through time simulations, allowing the solvent to move around, and stop it at different times in the simulations and extract the geometry. And then from this, you run optical rotations. And so I have to use a less accurate method to run these optical rotations because they're, they're larger calculations, but it just provides another method of the study. So the first molecule we studied, or that I was doing calculations on, is S-methyl oxybate. So S refers to one of the absolute configurations, one of the mirror images. You can see the chiral center is right here, that carbon. Um, and I did this molecule because it's a molecule that had already been studied at Virginia Tech. It's one that um, has been computed in both in the gas phase and with one water, so I was able to compare my results and see if they aligned with what has already been done, make sure I was getting hang of this before I jumped into new things. And then I also studied it with the solvent hydrogen sulfide. And so this is just changing one atom in the solvent between water and that, and just to test how these two differ in optical rotations. So now the main molecule that I've been using and focusing on in my research is s 2 chloropropionate nitrile. Um, and I've done both the explicit solvation and the molecular dynamics for this, um, the water in a box sort model that I talked about before. So I've done this with solvents of water and ammonia, ammonia being the most recent of the solvents I've been working on, um, and just got a lot of different results. What you see here is something I took from Spartan. Like I said, Spartan is more visualizing, allowing you to see what's going on um, rather than computing them. So this, was, this is the main focus of my research right now. So rather than throwing up a whole bunch of numbers that aren't going to mean a whole lot, um, I decided to focus on two main aspects of my research, um, one or my results. One being the wavelength effect or the optical rotary dispersion, and the second being the sensitivity of these calculations. So if we look at this graph, we have two structures. The top structure referring to structure one, which is the blue line. And as you can see, as the wavelength of the polarized light changes, as you get larger wavelengths, the specific rotation or optical rotation changes as well. So it's very dependent upon the wavelength you used. So this is good to know in lab. So if you're comparing it with something that's been calculated at a different wavelength, you know they're not going to match. So that's the first um, part of my results. And the second is the sensitivity. So I chose two structures that are very different from each other. Um, not all mine are this drastic, but technically, these should produce the exact same optical rotations because these are the exact same molecule, except this has three waters in between the alpha carbon and the nitrile group here. This is a nitrogen, hydrogen bonding together. And this just has those three waters flipped between the chloride and the nitrile here. And so these should produce the same optical rotation, but computationally, because these are so sensitive calculations, at one wavelength, they're going to produce very different specific rotations. 45 in one direction versus negative 24, which is in the complete opposite direction. So this is, we're trying to understand why this is happening, and this really emphasizes the fact that we need to um, 
study this and understand and um, make these more reliable before we can implement these in the lab. So, yeah. Dr. King is going to talk about some of his research in this. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. Just to be clear about this last uh, slide, uh, what's sensitive is the property, not the calculation. So the, the water is over here, give an optical rotation of uh, 45 degrees, and the water is over here, moved over here in this picture, give an optical rotation of minus 24. To a theoretical chemist, this is a, a nightmare, uh, but it's also a, a, an opening for grant money Lots of research and other things, right? Uh, it's surprising the extent to which uh, the solvent can be ignored for a pretty decent calcu uh, rough calculation of many properties. But this one, uh, this one, uh, that is not not the case. So one of the things that you can do with uh, theoretical chemistry or computational chemistry specifically is that you can. Uh, you can dream up bizarre types of experiments that would be impossible or almost impossible to do in the lab. This, I guess, is also the great danger of computational chemistry because you can do calculations which are junk uh, <laughs> by putting in something that is absurd and, and getting junk back out. Um, but we can also carry out some interesting uh, thought experiments coupled with theory to better understand uh, how a property depends upon the structure of a system. So this is a, a thought experiment, uh, what began as a thought experiment in my head a few months ago. And that is uh, calculating the optical rotation of, of water. Now, this may surprise some or students who have had organic chemistry at first, because the water molecule H2O here is achiral, or it's not chiral at all. Uh, so if you take the mirror image of this thing, you get the same thing back. If you take water and you measure its optical rotation, you get zero, exactly zero. Um, however, as Sarah pointed out, water still can have major uh, effects uh, on the optical rotation of a chiral solute molecule that it uh, surrounds. And furthermore, uh, clusters of water molecules all by themselves are chiral. So I tried to summarize this here. The water molecule, H2O, is not chiral. Liquid water is not chiral. So if you take a bunch of water and you measure its optical rotation, it's what we call isotropic. All the molecules are randomly pointed in random directions, and they all essentially cancel out, and you get an optical rotation of zero. Uh, however, a water cluster, by this we mean five water molecules, 50 water molecules, right? three water molecules. A water cluster is typically chiral. So here's the question. How does the magnitude of the optical rotation change as the water cluster size increases? Now, this is, I think, an interesting thought and question all by itself. Um, but why might you also want to know the answer to this? Well, we are ultimately going to um, need to calculate the optical rotation of solutes with explicit solvent molecules with additional models on the outside. The ultimate goal here you know, is still a, a a few years down the road. And one question is, how many, and this is, uh, I think Sarah maybe didn't say this directly, but one of the primary uh, motivations of her work uh, is that uh, we need to know how many of these explicit solvent molecules we need to have in our calculation. So that's one of the reasons we're doing all these tests with one, two, three, and as many as we can uh, going forward. Well relevant to the answer to that question, how many water molecules do I have to add before I can sort of reach the end of what I need to know is, well, what's the optical rotation of a water cluster all by itself? Uh, so here I try to summarize that. The answer may provide a clue to the extent of explicit solvation that will be needed in future models. So here is some uh, work that I did, complementary work same time Sarah was doing her solute solvent stuff. I uh, generated water clusters, random water clusters in molecular dynamic simulations. So this is a classical ball and spring model, put a bunch of uh, simple atom model, uh, models, molecular models in a box, give them some kinetic energy and let them bounce around. 
And then I took, at random times, I took shells of a certain radius. So I chose an arbitrary point in space, collected clusters. This is all water molecules within 2.5 angstroms of a particular point in space, within 3.5, 4.5. You can see uh, there are many more water molecules quickly, right, as this radius gets big, because the volume goes to the cube of the radius, which is what matters for our uh, calculation costs get big quickly here as um, R gets bigger. And this is uh, somewhat a preliminary uh, results, and I'm trying to get more of them. But this shows how the average magnitude of the optical rotation changes as the size of the sphere gets larger and larger. Now, I should clarify that at any given moment, the optical rotation of a cluster, it might be positive, it might be negative. So if you take this and you average it, you just get zero. At least if you have good sampling. If you have good sampling. And we do get pretty close to zero. But what I'm trying to, what I've plotted here is the average of the, the mean of the absolute value. What's the average of the absolute value? What's the magnitude of that optical rotation? If we imagine going uh, out to infinity, at some point we have so many water molecules that our optical rotation should be zero. But how far uh, close to infinity do we have, do we have to get? Uh, because we're never going to do uh, that calculation. And we don't know, um, but probably this is the first time in the world anybody has collected this kind of information. Uh, it was exciting to see that it looks like there is a maximum in this, which is interesting, at about three angstroms, and then it starts uh, to tail off. So what this tail looks like over here is a very interesting question. Um, I have a bunch of nodes at the Supercomputing Institute working on it, uh, and uh, I, I, don't, I, don't know what, um, I don't know what we will find. But this should give us some information about how the solvation shells that we include around our solute in future calculations uh, affect the optical rotation and how much uh, of that explicit solvation we will need. Uh, so this is uh, my exciting plot. Uh, at the, at the moment, but not yet uh, complete. So since I'm here, I'll go ahead and uh, quickly summarize these, and then uh, Sarah and I can take uh, questions. What are the major uh, conclusions? First, optical rotation is extremely sensitive to the type of solvent and the position of a solvent molecule at any time uh, around the solute. Uh, what you might hope to find is some simple trends that would allow you to predict uh, if there were simple trends, they probably would already have been discovered. And in a sense, the fact that there aren't any simple trends is what keeps us in business uh, doing really expensive quantum chemistry calculations. But we are uh, some of the first people to ever collect uh, some of this um, real data on solute solvent interactions and optical rotations. So there's the potential there uh, for some uh, more qualitative conclusions. Um, we're seeing probably already that you're going to have to have two or three uh, shells of the solvent to even get a reasonable result before we try to do other models for the continuum. Uh, we already have calculations going on on other solvents and solutes, so she showed you a couple of examples of molecules. Um, there are other researchers at Virginia Tech and, and uh, other students here that are working on other ones. Uh, we have already done some molecular dynamic simulations, so I described uh, some of those, but we uh, could do a lot uh, more. We will do a lot more of that. And I guess this one I kind of mentioned before. This is the goal. Uh, how far away are we from the goal? Uh, I don't know. It depends on how important it is to everyone involved. Uh, it could be 10 years. It could be 10 years, but the goal here is sufficiently important that it would be, it would be well worth uh, well worth that kind of investment. So the ultimate goal is that we can correctly predict right, with a quantum mechanical calculation which one is the plus and which one is the minus. So to drive home the main point here again uh, in a minute, when we do our calculations on the computer, we start from a completely different perspective uh, from the experimentalists. So Sarah builds her molecule in Spartan. She builds this or she builds this. She knows, right, before we push go uh, or run, uh, if we put in the one with this arrangement or if we put in the one with this arrangement. The experimentalist 
if he makes two enantiomers and isolates one, and then go measures its optical rotation, learns that the uh, direction of the optical rotation is plus or minus, but doesn't know which one is the plus and which one is the minus. Uh, so this is the great goal. If we could do this in aqueous solution with some reliability, then that would be uh, very valuable. So how are we going to get there? Uh, the property is so sensitive, it's clear that we're going to need a real quantum mechanical calculation on the solute. We're going to need some explicit solvation shells like the calculations that Sarah showed you where we have solvent molecules around the solute. Uh, we're going to have to do molecular dynamics, which means we're going to have to sample around the different configurations that solvent molecules can have around the solute. And we haven't talked about this, but on the outside, there's also going to be some kind of uh, continuum solvent model. So way out there, we can use simple models for what uh, is essentially a charged soup, where you don't have to keep track of which atom is where, but you have uh, sort of the right kind of environment. And no one, there's, I don't think there's anybody in the world right now that uh, has expertise in all of these areas. Um, and can pull them all together and do that kind of calculation. But uh, it's coming and uh, it'll, be, it'll be some years. I want to acknowledge our uh, collaborators. So we mentioned a couple times uh, a good friend of mine, Daniel Crawford. I shared an office with him once upon a time in graduate school. He's a, a professor of chemistry at Virginia Tech. And besides collaborating with us on this project, he has uh, National Science Foundation funding to support it. Uh, he also hosted uh, Sarah and I on a short visit last June uh, to his research group where we went down for a couple days to find out what they were doing and what, how we could contribute most effectively. Um, before I forget, also mention there is a major, the major conference in theoretical chemistry this year is in Lugano, Switzerland, uh, the first week of June. And it is likely that um, Dr. Crawford will be presenting some of our results at that meeting. Uh, secondly, the Minnesota uh, Supercomputing Institute, so this is uh, uh, obviously down at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it's a major supercomputing facility that all uh, professors at uh, universities in the state can apply for uh, time on. And uh, they have uh, granted me computer time at their facility in various amounts for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and then finally, the Edgar Scholarship Program that uh, supported us uh, last summer. So thank you very much, and we have a couple minutes for questions. I'm curious. Um, so you explain why you why you chose the uh, the, the ether compound? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as kind of a calibration, but I guess you could go back a level and say. Well, why was that one selected, or why did you choose the nitrile mm -hmm. compound? Are those ones that get large, well, the big, large magnitudes of changes, or like what was your? Yep. Yeah. Because yes. you could pick simpler ones, mm -hmm. right? The methyl oxyurane, which is the first one that I said I um, had been studied at Virginia Tech, and then I was trying to repeat it, was originally chosen because it's a difficult molecule. It doesn't give the results that sometimes we expect. Like there's other molecules that have been tested that are simpler and in the gas phase match experiment and are like pretty simple and like straightforward. This one has problems. So <laughs> they've been studying it to see why it's different and why it's problematic. And so I just chose it because it's one they've been studying and just to repeat it. Um, the next one, chloropropionitile. Um, I don't really know why we chose this one. It's a large molecule and it has an obvious chiral center with just, you know, the four groups attached to it. Um, and it has some electronegative groups. It's got the nitrogen and the chloride, which provides an easy method for, like, arranging solvent molecules around it. Because if you get a molecule that's just completely made of carbons yet chiral, it's going to be difficult to make these solvent shells. Like, where do I place the solvent? You know, it's not like, oh, this alpha carbon is nice and or, like, yeah, figure. but yeah, it's not like I can align it right with the alpha carbon because that's where the solvent would be expected to go. So, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah Sarah, uh, Sarah said it pretty well. The, the methyl oxy ring, this molecule turns out to be pathological. 
so it's been a test case and uh, three or four different quantum mechanical theories get three or four different answers. Uh, so that's and it, obviously fairly small. Uh, so there, there had been, this is probably the, that's the single molecule on which there have been the most optical rotation uh, calculated. Um, on, on this particular uh, solute, it's not the only one you know, that, that we're interested in, that we're doing calculations on. I, I uh, second what Sarah said, but it's nice to find minima. You know, if you can make a real hydrogen bond, if you have an electronegative atom, then you can find a real minimum. Uh, that's nice. Um, usually, the way we would approach these problems is we, we would ask, well, if I want to understand the interaction between the, the, the solvent and how it affects optical rotation, right? I go find something with a really strong interaction. So go find a molecule that can make a, a hydrogen bond with the solvent, use water, methyl oxygen. But in this case, that might have been a mistake because in this case, the, the effect is so large uh, that it's hard to interpret, right? And, and so you might, uh, if you went back and you sort of rethought the whole approach, you might say, no, I should choose a solvent which has the smallest possible perturbation or interaction with solute. Uh, and, and maybe you make progress a little faster. It's a few minutes till 11. We could take one more question if anyone has one. Okay, thank you all for Thank coming. You. Have a nice day.